Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church of St. Albans, those of you who are worshiping with us and those of you who are worshiping from home. Uh, we have a few announcements that are in the bulletin. First of all, Festival of Faith is online this year. Um, it's August 29th, and there's information in your bulletin. On August 22nd, we will have a pantry parade. The mission committee is doing this, um, and there will be um, popsicles on the playground. Masks are required, of course, on the playground. But if you can volunteer to unload or load donations, uh, please contact Kathy Maddie. If you want to explore Lament with the Presbyterian women, there's a Bible study. Um, it will be in a Zoom gathering. Those of you who um, want to are invited to join Camp in a Box. It's in your bulletin next Wednesday. Wednesday, there's going to be a party. You bring your own snacks and balloons and get ready to play some fun and silly games. So that sounds like a lot of fun. Okay, and Sunday School News, the adult Sunday School Zoom class is not meeting this month. Well, there is a plan to resume in September. Um, youth group, we need your assistance with the pantry parade next Saturday from 945 till noon, if you can stay that long. Uh, if you uh, volunteer to load or unload donations or serve popsicles, um, need to wear a mask and gloves are advisable. Also, there is a stated session meeting today following worship at 1115. If you can silently join me in the call to worship, how very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like a summer rain which restores the parched earth. It is like a cool breeze at the shore of a lake, at the top of a mountain, or through a crowded city street. God meets us here. We have gathered to worship the maker of our days, the restorer of our souls, and the breath of our lives. Okay, our gathering hymn this morning is In Christ There Is No East or West. Those of you who are present, if you could please meditate on the lyrics and follow along at home, please feel free to sing along. Normally at this time, we would pass the peace by shaking hands, but instead of that, remember, we'll do our jazz hands. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Our call to worship, how very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like a summer rain which restores the parched earth. It's like a cool breeze at the shore of the lake at the top of a mountain or through a crowded street. God meets us here. We have gathered to worship the maker of our days, the restorer of our souls, and the breath of our lives. For our call to confession, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please silently join me in the prayer of confession. When we try to go it on our own, lacking faith in divine providence, Lord, have mercy. When we have not recognized God at work in the faith of others, Christ, have mercy. In all that we have done and all that we have left undone, Lord, have mercy. 
God calls us, calls each of us by name and cries out with tears of joy as we recognize God in our admission of need. Praise be to God who welcomes us as we are, challenges us to let go of our guilt, and provides a way for us to walk on together. Our scripture reading this morning begins with Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 15. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept while Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them, and after that his brothers talked with him. From Romans chapter 11, verses 1 to 2a and 29 to 32, I ask then, has God rejected this, his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. Within your mighty hand, 
When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know your God. Find rest, my soul, in Christ alone. Know His power, in quietness and trust. When the oceans rise and thunders fall, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know your God. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know your God. I will be still and know your God. <laughs> All right. Well, good. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let's see, I noticed there's uh, some young young disciples. Uh, I don't know. Do you guys do you guys stay there or you, you can stay where you are? Look, especially you guys, you look like you're really comfortable uh, sitting on laps. Uh, but if you want to come up, that's good. Which, whichever. Uh, let me talk a little bit about Joseph. We we kind of got the end of the story, almost the end of the story there. But le but let me ask this. Uh, for you young guys, do you ever get angry at your sister? Does that ever happen? You get angry, maybe your sister, your brother, and you really wanted to, if you had a stick, you'd want to hit them, maybe go do something like that. Does that ever happen to you? Well, maybe not. But it happened with Joseph. Now, Joseph was the youngest of, of 13 children, I think, right? 12 boys and, and one girl. And Joseph's, Joseph was, in a sense, lucky, you could say, because he was their father's favorite, right? His father treated him better than his brothers. He gave him uh, some special clothes, right? Often we, we sometimes we hear about Joseph having a coat of many colors. Really, what a better way to translate that? It's a coat with long sleeves, but but with the long sleeves that means that Joseph didn't have to work. He didn't have to kind of roll his sleeves up and and get his hands dirty, but his brothers did. All right, and maybe what made it worse in in his his brother's mind was Joseph was a tattletale. Now, you guys never did anything like that, right? You never told anything bad on, on your sister. Well, Joseph did. Joseph tattled on his brothers, and his brothers got really angry with him. They were jealous of him. And so the, there was a one day when his father had sent Joseph to check on his brothers who were out taking care of their flocks, and they decided, well, some of them wanted to kill, actually kill Joseph. They were that angry at him. But they decided, no, they're just going to throw him down in this little pit. And then there were some people going by, and they 
decided they they would sell Joseph into slavery, right? That would just kind of get him out of the way and they wouldn't have to worry about him anymore. Now, Joseph ended up in Jesus in, in Egypt and he was a slave and then his master's wife got angry at him and he ended up in prison. And Joseph had a really rough time but God was still working in Joseph's life, and God helped him interpret a dream that there was going to be a famine in Egypt. And so the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave Joseph kind of charge over the country so he could collect the food, and they'd be prepared when there was a famine. And there was a famine up in Israel where, where Joseph's brothers lived, and so they ran out of food. And so they had to come to Egypt to buy food. And they ran into Joseph again. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but his brothers didn't recognize him. And you know, Joseph had the chance to pay them back, right? Joseph had a chance to get even with them, but he didn't do that. Because Joseph realized that God had been at work in, at all this. And even though his brothers did bad things to him, God was able to turn something good out of all that. Right? So even when you get angry with your sister, don't do anything bad to her. Right? <laughs> even though you might get in trouble, well, even though you might get in trouble, even though you might get hurt, God can still work through that to bring about good things because God loves you. And even when bad things are happening, God loves you, and God can turn those bad things around so that good things happen for you and even for your sister who might have been bad to you. All right, let's have a little prayer. God, we thank you that you love us all the time. We thank you for giving us brothers and sisters and family members. Sometimes we don't get along. But we know, God, that even when bad things happen to us, you can, you can turn those bad things into good things. And that you can bless us. And we trust that you will continue to do that. Help us to live together and get along with one another. But help us know that you always love us and will bring good in our lives. Amen. All right. Well, good. Well, thank you so much. Uh, for coming forward. And thank you thank you all for listening. All right. Okay. All right. Let's see. Uh well well let me say good morning. I'm Ed Thompson. I serve as the general presbyter for the Presbytery of West Virginia. Right now I think we're at 122 churches. We've got some churches in the process of closing. Uh but we our churches stretch from Morgantown down to Bluefield and from White Sulphur Springs to Canova. And we work together. We work together to do special events like the Festival of Faith that's coming up. We work together to provide a camp and conference uh, center at uh, Bluestone, which is just outside of Hinton. We work together to support campus ministry at WVU and at Marshall, uh, places like Fairmont State and Colcord and West Virginia State. Uh, we work together uh, with partners in Kenya, in Neary Presbytery. Last summer, we sent a group over there that helped build a church. Uh, this summer, there were supposed to be folks from Kenya coming to visit us, but that got canceled because of the pandemic. Uh, but we still have that partnership. And we have a resource center. If you need material for Bible study or uh, to learn more about scripture, or to help support your youth group or the women's group. We've got material there that can be of service to you, uh, and it's free. All you have to do is come in or just send an email to Nellie Howard, our resource center director, and we'll get that material to you. And we've got staff that can help with Christian education. If you have questions about our polity, uh, if you have questions about sending in mission money or per capita, and, uh, and me, and then you got me. Uh, my job description says I'm a facilit I'm the facilitator of ministry, mission, and relationships. 
which means I go to a lot of meetings now, a lot of Zoom meetings, uh, and also read a lot of email. But occasionally they do let me preach, and I'm glad to do that uh, and glad to be here with you this morning. And thank you for your support to the Presbytery of West Virginia. Our ministry, my ministry, wouldn't be helpful without, without your help. So thank you. All righty, our uh, gospel reading for this morning comes from the gospel according to Matthew. And let's see, here we go. And we'll read from chapter 15 and verses 10 through uh, 28. And here we see Jesus teaching the crowd, and then um, he encounters a Canaanite woman who's come asking for help for her daughter. Uh, not, not really Jesus on one of his good days, but anyway. Uh, Listen now for the word of God as it's found in the gospel according to Matthew. Then Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into a mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the, the disciples approached and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when you heard what you said? Jesus answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Then Jesus said, are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles for out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. So Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And just then a Canaanite woman came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the woman came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed immediately. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One of the real turning points in my life came when I registered as a conscientious objector during the Vietnam War. I came to the conclusion that I could not in good faith kill anyone because of my faith in Jesus Christ. 
Though I grew up in the church, and as a Presbyterian church, that was not directly addressed in Sunday school or from the pulpit on Sunday mornings, at least on the Sundays when I was, when I was there. And that was pretty often, well, all right. I was always regular in Sunday school growing up, didn't start attending worship until like seventh grade when we're going through communicants class and we're supposed to join the church, all right? But I was right, pretty regular after that. We did sing, Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. We sang that in Sunday school. We sang in Christ, there is no east or west, our opening hymn. And from the pulpit, I heard sermons on the passage from Galatians 3. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, male or female, slave or free, but we are all one in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church was shaping my faith, forming my faith, but it wasn't helping me as I struggled with this decision. And so I had to do a lot of searching, a lot of uh, trying to figure out what I believed. Um, and this is in the age before the internet, before there was Google. And so I had difficulty finding things to, that were helping me out. What some of the material I did find that was helpful was written by the Quakers, and that, that influenced me. That helped me. And I even got to the point where I thought maybe I should become a Quaker. And I, I thought about that. The, one of the problems was I had never met a real Quaker in person, right? And as far as I could tell, there was no Quaker meeting house for at least 50 miles. And I assume there was one in Pittsburgh. We lived northwest of the city, but I never got there or very seldom got there. So that wasn't really helpful to me. But really more importantly, why I never took that step was because the Quakers, although they respected Jesus, they never really thought of him as savior. And in good Presbyterian fashion, I believe Jesus Christ was my Lord and Savior. There was something special about him, something different about him. And I respected him. I loved him. I held Jesus up as my role model, right? And you know, I think, thinking back on almost 40 years of preaching, I could summarize many of my sermons, maybe most of my sermons, as be like Jesus. I mean, that's what it comes down to. That's, that's what sums it up. However, with this passage from the Gospel of Matthew, I, I can't really say it. In this passage, not so much. And maybe Jesus was having a bad day. Yes, Jesus is fully divine. He's also fully human. So maybe, maybe Jesus got up on the wrong side of the bed. Maybe he had a toothache. Maybe he had some bad matzah or some bad fish and his stomach was bothering him. It just, this just doesn't seem like the Jesus that we know and love. In this passage, Jesus almost comes across as a petty bureaucrat, right? And I, I suppose in some ways that maybe describes my job description, hopefully not the petty part, but at least, you know, maybe for better or worse, I, I'm a bureaucrat. I, I, I spend most of my time in, in the office and, you know, just, not really shuffling papers, but shuffling email. Uh, but when this woman comes to Jesus seeking his help, his help for her daughter, 
he responds to her with silence. And the disciples are upset. This woman is shouting. She's bothering him. She's bothering them. And they want to send her away. And Jesus responds, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so it's almost like he's saying, that's not in my job description. Leave me alone. I suppose at least he doesn't say, well, we'll come back tomorrow. Jesus seems to slam the door in this woman's faith, in this woman's face, like he's not going to help her. And then when she gets down and begs, it's like he adds insult to injury by saying, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Now, some commentators explain this by saying, well, he uses a term really for puppies, and so it's not, not that insulting. Others will say, well, he's just trying to test this woman's faith. Essentially, though, Jesus calls her a dog. That's not really a term of endearment, no matter how you try to explain it, explain it away. And so really, rather than being like Jesus in this story, we need to be like the Canaanite woman. Now, Jill Duffield, who serves as the editor of the Presbyterian Outlook and who's going to be the keynote speaker at the Festival of Faith, wrote in her weekly lectionary column that rather than having asking the question, WWJD, what would Jesus do, which we often ask, that really in this case we should ask WWCWD, what would the Canaanite woman do? Because this woman is persistent. She's tenacious. She holds on and keeps coming on despite this rebuke, despite the silence. She doesn't back down even when she is rebuffed, even when Jesus, in a sense, tries to push her away. She persisted. Nevertheless, she persisted because she believed that Jesus had the faith that Jesus had the power to help her. She believed Jesus had the power to cure her daughter from the demons that were tormenting her. This woman serves as an example for us. We can learn from her. Because sometimes it seems like God is silent. Now, maybe that's happened to us before. We have prayed for something, prayed for help for ourselves, prayed for help for someone we love, and our prayers aren't answered, or they aren't answered in the way we want or when we want them. And so, you know, that can be frustrating. That can serve as a challenge to our faith. But maybe especially now during this pandemic, maybe God seems silent. Because over 160,000 Americans have died. Case rates seem to be soaring across the country. Congress can't seem to reach a deal on a second stimulus package. Uh, the economy sh seems shaky. And I would not want to be a parent who had kids in school, trying to decide if they should go back in the classroom or whether they should just learn online or whether they should do some kind of hybrid. Not sure what, what would be safe. Not sure what, might, what kind of difficulties I might find if I needed childcare, if I didn't have relatives around who could, who could help me out. And I don't think I'd want to be a teacher, especially a teacher in my age, or especially a teacher that had some health conditions. Because I'd have to wonder whether I'd be putting my life on the line if I was going to go back to work. 
And on top of that, we have the death of George Floyd, which seems to have sparked a nationwide conversation, and maybe nationwide protests. That death has revealed the depths of the racial divide in our country. And maybe those of us with white skin can say, yes, we've made progress, but I'm not sure if my skin was a different color that I'd be able to say the same thing. We just seem to be stuck in so many ways. And in, in the silence and in the struggle, we, we can learn from the story of Joseph. And for most of Joseph's story, God, God seems silent. And that stands in contrast to the story of the other patriarchs. Abraham has multiple encounters with God. Jacob, Joseph's father, encounters God several times. One time he wrestles with God throughout the night. And yet for most of this story, God seems absent. God seems absent. And yet God is working behind the scenes in, in all this, in all that's happening to Joseph from the time he's sold into, this, into slavery, from the time he ends up in prison, from, to the time when he, he's put in a position of power to collect food during the years of abundance so that the people would have food during the years of famine. Joseph has risen to a position of authority. And it's when he's in this position of authority that he encounters his brothers. And I'm sure the thought runs through Joseph's mind, now's my chance. Now I can pay them back. Now I can get even with them for what they did to me. And in some ways we can't blame Joseph for thinking that way. Then it hits him, I think. It's like the light bulb goes on and he realizes how God has used him, how God has used his brothers. He realizes how God has been at work in all the bad things that had happened to him to bring about a good thing. There's food, food that can feed his family, food that can feed the people of Egypt. God has taken the evil deeds that his brothers did and brought about some good. And this hits Joseph like a ton of bricks. He begins to cry. He cries so loud that the Egyptians who's, who he had sent away can he hear it. He realizes what God has done, how God has, sa has sent him ahead to save his family. Joseph realizes all this. And although I don't think he would use the same words that Paul did in his letter to the Romans, he would agree, I think, with Paul in that God's gifts are irrevocable. God wants to, God does show mercy on all. And here, in his encounter with his brothers, Joseph shows that same mercy. So may God help us to reflect on our story, our history, so that like Joseph, we can see how God has been at work and understand how God has been, been with us the whole time, working behind the scenes as it were, even though we didn't see it at the time, even though we didn't recognize it. 
because we only see patterns, we only see God's hand when we look backwards so, so much of the time. May God help us to trust that God does have the power to heal, the power to change, the power to transform us in our world through Jesus Christ. God reaches out to us and intervenes in the world so that God might have mercy on us all. And may God help us persist even in the face of silence, even in the face of what seems like rejection. May God help us to speak up for those we love, for those we know who are suffering. Because God does hear us. Because Jesus does have the power to save, the power to heal, the power to transform. And because the Spirit continues to inspire us so that we can be witnesses to God's love in our lives and in the lives of those we love, even in the face of the silence. Amen. Friends, will you join me now as... As we reflect on the Apostles' Creed, if you're at home, certainly feel free to say these words out loud. But let us at least reflect on these words, which have been used by Christians throughout the world and throughout the ages, that we might affirm our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, there are offering plates at, uh, at the entrance uh, to the fellowship hall here. If you're at home, please remember to send your gifts in. For in times of plenty and want, God provides for our deepest needs. So give generously out of the abundance of God's blessing, so that in these challenging times, God's work might continue. Will you join me now as, as we offer this prayer to dedicate our offering? Holy God, you are our provider. We dedicate to your service our lives and these gifts for your blessing in our work Please work in us and through us to extend your love and care here and around the world. Amen. All right, there are a number of prayer concerns that are listed in the bulletin uh, for congregation members, for folks in care facilities, and then uh, concerns for family and friends. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, lift these folks. Uh, in your prayer during the week. Uh, but uh, let us turn now to God in prayer, and we will conclude with the Lord's Prayer. If you're at home, certainly feel free to pray that prayer aloud. Here, uh, let us reflect on those words uh, that we can remember how Jesus has taught us. But let us turn now to God in prayer. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day uh, and for this summer season. Uh, for some, it is a time to rest and relax. For others, it is a time of uncertainty, especially as they look to the future. So many lives have been disrupted because of uh, this pandemic that is afflicting us. There are people who are sick. There are people who have died. 
And if and when we go out, we have concerns about whether we will be safe or whether we too will contract this disease. And there is uncertainty as we look to the future, as we think about the coming school year, as we think about fall sports, with many competitions being uh, postponed or rescheduled to the spring, and yet there's, for many, there's still the hope that games can be played and uh, we will be able to enjoy that. God, these are difficult times. And there are some times on some days when we wonder where you are. There are times when we wonder if you hear us. There are times we wonder, are you going to help us? God, we ask that you would relieve these doubts these fears. We ask that you would give us hope. We ask that you would help us to hang on and to hang on to you. For even when you st seem silent, even when you seem absent, oh God, you are there working in the world, working in our lives. We can't always see that. It doesn't happen as quickly as we want. It doesn't happen as soon as we want. But ultimately, we trust that you are there. And we give you thanks for that. Lord, there are many folks listed in our bulletin. There are members of the congregation. There are those in care, in care facilities. And there are, there's a long list of other family members and friends uh, that we would lift up to you. Oh God, be with those who are so named, be with those that we care about. Bring healing, bring help, and give them the strength that we need, they need. Oh God, we pray for our president, Mr. Trump. We pray for members of the Congress as they deal with these difficult situations. We pray for our governor, Mr. Justice, and for members of our state legislature. Uh, guide them, give them wisdom in spite of the differing, their differing viewpoints, their differing risk tolerances, uh, and help them as they seek to provide guidance, as they seek to provide help for for our state and for our nation. And we pray, oh God, that you be with those who are in health care and caring for those who are suffering from COVID-19 and pray that you be with those who are working on vaccines and different ways, better ways uh, to treat this disease. God, we offer these prayers in the name of Jesus. And we pray even as our Lord has taught us to pray by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is in the bulb, There is a Flower. If you're at home, please feel free to sing along. Here, let us, let's just reflect on these words.
We receive now the benediction. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may God bless you and keep you. May God cause the divine light to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God turn toward you and grant you peace this day and every day. Amen.